Hello and uh, welcome to everyone to uh, this web event on gas pools hosted by Transfer Pricing Associates and uh, Coft Analytics. My name is uh, Peter Andersen. I'm a partner with, with TPA and I'm one of the speakers today. Uh, my co-speaker is uh, Gordon Hans from Coft Analytics in Canada. And before we start, I'd like just to uh, give a short presentation of of, of our two firms and our expertise in, in the area of um, financial transactions. TPA has for the past um, 10 years uh, done quite a few projects in the area of, um, of finance and, and treasury, so not limited to, to cash pools, but um, sometimes uh, designing full uh, transfer pricing policies for, for treasury and funding. Um, We've also been involved in, in, in a very large number of um, finance company projects. We have done quite a few uh, projects on uh, determination of, of guarantee fees uh, and, of course, also interest rates on, on loans. And the last uh, three to four years, we have done a number of, of projects in the area of cash pooling, uh, which is the subject of, of today's uh, presentation. Uh, my co-speaker from, uh, from Canada, from uh, Coft Analytics, um, is also fully specialized in, in transfer pricing of financial transactions, and in fact, uh, in addition to the expertise I just mentioned, uh, they are also heavily involved in a lot of controversy work in, in different countries around the uh, the world um, in the area of, of financial transactions. Uh, before we start uh, going through the slides and the, and the presentation, uh, I'd like to mention that we are aiming at, at um, uh, limiting the presentation to around 30 minutes today. So I think that's a good Good time for good timing for, for this presentation. Um, we also realize that the topic of, of cash pooling uh, can be quite a broad topic, and um, we, because we see quite a lot of variety in the area of cash pooling, we see, for instance, um, cases where uh, there's cash pooling uh, in within oil and gas uh, companies, which is typically a quite a cash-rich setting, which means that most cash pool participants have excess liquidity. Um, on a structural basis and only from time to time need liquidity, which also means that the cash pool leader um, has a, a functionality that is also uh, to invest excess liquidity in the money markets. And then we have cases where there's a more balanced position, um, meaning that the deposits and advances sort of balance out on a, on a, on a structural basis. And uh, the third category is where there's a, a need for funding um, which means that the cash pool leader is also obtaining funds from the market. Um, um, so that, of course, also uh, gives different types of functionality to the cash pool leader. We also said that we're going to limit our, our presentation to um, fiscal cash pools, um, and we have made a, a selection of, of, of topics to, um, to discuss. Um, so typically, how do you structure the analysis, um, which methods could be applicable, um, and also the topic of, of credit rating, should that be performed or not, uh, and to what extent is that relevant in the cash pool or uh, when loans are, are made uh, to the pool and from the pool. Um, looking at the agenda for today, um, we first have a, a discussion of the commercial rationale for using cash pools. I think that's always of, of importance when, when the transfer pricing analysis is on the table. Um, then we have a few examples of, of how cash pools can be set up uh, for physical cash pooling. Then we move on to, to looking at a few OCD references. There's not too many, but uh, let's have a look at what's, what's available, as OCD does provide the, the framework um, for any transfer pricing analysis to its uh, transfer pricing guidelines. Then we'll go through a number of selected transfer pricing issues for, for cash pools. And after that, move on to, to a few uh, court cases. We found two court cases that addresses um, cash pooling, one from Norway and, and one from France. And at least one of them gives quite a good in, insight in some of the issues that tax authorities they, they typically address when they are uh, auditing a, a cash pool setup. And finally, we're going to round off with a, a slide with a selection of the most important criteria to be considered uh, in in designing a transfer pricing policy for a cash pool. Um, and finally, there's an, there's an opportunity to ask questions and, and we'll provide some answers. Uh, 
moving on to the uh, the commercial rationale for for cash pools um i think this is critical just to to discuss uh, because if one look at cash pools it's not a, a an arrangement or a transaction that that one will see among uh, unrelated parties and that already for some tax authorities uh, creates the first um, sort of hurdle in, in accepting it because they are used to looking at transactions that the third parties all to do so you can benchmark them in, in a fairly easy easy manner um, however um, the fact that that um, uh, such an arrangement is not seen among third parties not per se a, a reason for a tax authority to, to disqualify the uh, the setup but might trigger to to ask and find out why um, a certain arrangement has been been established and what is critical to to multinationals or international companies is that um, you want to minimize your funding cost and and also maximize the return you will be getting on on excess cash um, there's typically also a need to centralize um, any activities in the area of, of treasury or funding um, to allow uh, group companies and operating companies to focus on running the business rather than um, spending time on 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 hedging or um, dealing with their own uh, liquidity situation and one will often see that a cash pool is subject to a detailed um, a treasury policy which sets out the authority of the cash pool leader or the mandate to the cash pool leader for say investment of excess liquidity in the money market um, so that's that's typically also a good opportunity to to um, get the um, um, a start, or get a contrail framework uh, for risk management or management of excess liquidity established within within the group. Finally, there's also the point that um, taking control of your uh, your own uh, funding and, and excess liquidity might be be more critical after the, the credit crisis, where some banks were rescued or even some banks were went down with with uh, the effect of causing losses among investors and even uh, uh, customers. There's also a benefit in, in terms of having a lower number of, of transactions. Um, and, and finally, if you have to uh, go to the market to obtain funding, it's it's typically better to, to do this on a consolidated basis um, in order to get a better rate with, with a bank rather than the situation where each group company will organize its own funding and, and negotiate local arrangement with the uh, local banks. The next slide shows a, a simple example of, of how a cash pool can be set up and, and with the related um, or associated intercompany transactions. So this slide shows a very simple structure where each subsidiary in each country will, will make deposits into the cash pool leader's bank account in another country or get a, an advance from that account. If we look at the next slide, there's a slightly more advanced uh, setup and uh, this also reflects that many banks in the last uh, five to eight years have been developing uh, products in the area of cash pooling, um, including the right IT infrastructure to allow the management of, of cash pools uh, with, with participants in quite a few countries. We know that there's other other types of, of structures involved and we're not going to go into more detail about this but just uh, leave it as it is with these two slides to show how, how things can be set up if we take a look at the um, OCD references I mentioned before that there was not uh, too many references around um, these two comments are made here is, is from the OCD transfer pricing guidelines and, and the first one is from the services chapter where there's a statement on financial services which basically says that in, in many cases the expectation is that the compensation will be built into a to a spread um, the second point is that cash pools are not transactions seen among unrelated parties we had a brief mention of that before and the um, OCD guidelines now in, in the new chapter on, on business restructuring explicitly states that um, this is not a reason for uh, disregarding a transaction by a tax administration. Um, in fact, the assumption is that the arm's length principle can be applied and, and should be applied to um, to such a, an arrangement. Um, we're going to come back and discuss that when we look at the uh, Norwegian uh, court case in, in 
a little bit later. Gordon, I would like to hand over to you. Thanks, Peter. Um, right, so moving on to uh, the transfer pricing issues related to, uh, to cash pools. Uh, I think the, the key to any transfer pricing study around cash pools is, is really understanding the structure. Uh, uh, as Peter has shown in the previous slide, the, the cash pool structures and the complexity of these structures can be very diverse. Um, your cash pool, for instance, may include an external bank responsible for the management of the cash pool, and you may have a cash pool leader whose responsibilities are very limited in nature. Uh, conversely, you may have an in-house bank which takes full responsibility uh, and risks of managing that cash pool or you may have some hybrid of these two uh, extremities. Uh, you may also have a parent that is guaranteeing uh, or covering the cash pool deficits, um, as well just the, the sheer number of the participants or the locations of, the, of, of your participants can add to the complexity of your structure. Regardless, uh, it's, it's, as I said, very important uh, that uh, you, uh, the structure of the cash pool is understand uh, is very well understood and is well documented, uh, including the functions and the risks of each of the cash pool participants. And this is going to help you to identify uh, the transactions or transaction types that must be uh, analyzed for transfer pricing purposes. Uh, the more obvious cash pool transactions uh, include the, the lending margins charged to the borrowing parties, uh, the deposit margins that are earned by the depositing entities, uh, but there are, could also be a, a management fee uh, to the cash pool leader or in-house bank um, or a guarantee fee to the parent or, or any other guarantors in the structure. Uh, one other issue that can add complexity to your cash pool uh, is if it is a profit center. Uh, this may mean uh, additional analysis to determine if there is a residual profit after compensating the other parties for, for all the other transactions. Um, as well as additional analysis to determine uh, an appropriate allocation of those profits, profits uh, if need be. Moving on to the methodologies. Uh, unfortunately, there, there is no one best methodology that can be applied to, to all cash pool structures. Uh, as Peter said earlier, a, a cash pool is not an arm's length structure. We're not going to be able to find comparable uh, third-party cash pool agreements. They're going to provide us with some answers uh, as to, to how to price the transactions in our cash pool. Uh, that means we're going to have to, to look to other market data to set and test our transfer prices. Um, I would say, in general, the best, the best approach is, is to break the structure down into its, uh, into its smaller parts or on a per-transaction type basis and then select the best methodology for that type of transaction. Um, I say that, but I think it's also important that, that once you have looked at those parts and analyzed them separately and, and determined your pricing, uh, that, you, that you combine it again and look at some of those parts uh, to make sure that the structure as a whole still makes sense and uh, is still accomplishing the goals of, uh, of the, the cash pool in the first place. Uh, on a transactional basis, uh, which methodology is, is most appropriate uh, is dependent on you know, the transaction type, obviously, uh, but also, uh, and maybe more importantly, what data is available, uh, and is that data, data uh, reliable and, and comparable for, for uh, uh, benchmarking your tested transactions. Um, Obviously, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of market data out there, primary loan market data, uh, that, that can be used as, as cops for, for testing um, uh, the short-term borrowings of, in your cash pool uh, to your borrowers. Um, there's also likely going to be cops uh, available for pricing guarantee fees um, and even, even your management fees in your cash pool. Uh, what becomes complicated uh, is, the, is the pricing of the deposit margins. Uh, you may be able to find uh, market data on, uh, on deposit margins, although that's, that's not likely. Uh, 
but even if you could, uh, the the credit risk that's being borne by your uh, depositors is different. Uh, they're not bearing credit risk to uh, a AAA rated bank, but rather uh, it's the credit risk to the parent guarantor, or it's to the in-house bank, or or even it could be depending on your structure, uh, bearing the, the risk of the uh, the ultimate borrowers of those funds. Um, lastly, if if your cash pool is a profit center, it, it may it may be that your your in-house bank is is acting like a full-fledged bank with with similar functions and risks. Uh, and is therefore entitled to those profits, but if not, if it is more limited in its functions and more limited in its risk, uh, then um, uh, you may need to perform uh, a profit split analysis by, by looking at the contributions of each of the cash pool parties and, uh, and determining an allocation uh, of profits based on those contributions. Uh, other issues, uh, obviously credit risk, uh, Looking at the uh, or estimating the credit risk ratings for uh, the participants in your cash pool, um, you know, in addition to the borrowing entities, you, that may mean looking at the parents' uh, guarantor or other guarantors, uh, and it may mean looking at the uh, the house bank, um, or the in-house bank or cash pool leader as well. Um, obviously, that that seems like a, a lot of work, and and it can be. And one of the questions that we we get quite often is do we really need to do that for, for all of the participants? And uh, I would say that in general that depends on, on a couple of different things. First, uh, how large are the deposits uh, or borrowings in your, in your cash pool and how large is the potential tax risk if, if the pricing is incorrect? So really what is, what is the appetite for, for risk? Um, second, I would say that the more diverse your group or cash pool participants are, uh, the more important it may be to perform credit risk analysis on most or all of those participants. As an example, if, you, if, you have, if most of your participants are, are fairly similar uh, in terms of their size and their functions, uh, in terms of the markets that they're in, then understanding what the average credit quality of a group may be sufficient and pricing to the average credit quality uh, of the group may be sufficient as well. However, if there are uh, manufacturers and distributors and, and even service providers in your cash pool, um, if some are in developed markets and others are in um, developing markets, um, you know, if, or if there's simply just a, a big difference in terms of their size or the profitability of the participants, then that may um, that may mean it's it's more important for you to to look at the individuals. Uh, companies separately and, and get estimates of their credit risk separately. Um, finally, one last uh, consideration is, is the frequency uh, or how often you are uh, reviewing the, the cash flow structure and the pricing in your structure. Um, I would say that uh, you know deposit, the deposits and, and the borrowings in the cash flows by their nature are, are short term and uh, by virtue of that fact uh, you may want to look at the, the cash pool structure and, and the pricing uh, more frequently. I would say annually at least. But you know, depending on other 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 issues, you know, what if there's if the we're in a particular volatile time in the in the debt markets, then that may mean you you should look at that uh, even more frequently. Um, also, if there if there's a certain credit event that is affecting the group or uh, certain participants in your group, then that may mean you should take another, uh, another look at the, at the cash flow structure, at the pricings, and making sure, as I said earlier, that it's still meeting the goals of, 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 your, of your cash pool. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Peter now, and he's going to talk about uh, a couple of court cases. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. The next um, <clears throat> the next slide is about a a court case for Norway uh, from 2010, uh, which I think illustrates uh, some of the, the thinking of of tax authorities. Uh, I should say that in this uh, court case, when you read it, um, it's somewhat difficult to understand the the transfer pricing policy uh, for the cash pool, and I think that was probably also the reason it went to to court. Uh, 
uh, because there was not really full transparency about what happened in the cash pool and, and how profitable it was or, or not. Um, but it also illustrates the way that, that tax authorities will be looking at this, because if you uh, think about tax authorities and cash pools, what most of them, except for the, the, the tax authorities of the country where the cash pool leader is, is located, most of them will just see um, advances and deposits to a local cash pool participant, and they will just be uh, looking to see if, if the interest rates on those uh, loan transactions are consistent with the arm's length principle. <clears throat> so they will not sort of um, um, necessarily look at the detailed functionality of the cash pool leader and, and, and go into more details in, in, that, in that respect. What they, what they did in this case was to say, well, um, they tested the um, interest rate that a cash pool participant received on a deposit and uh, compared that with what that company could have achieved from a, or, or received from a local bank if the money had been deposited with the local bank instead. And they said, well, that's, that, that would have been more, so the compensation on, on those loan transactions was, was below the arm's length principle. Um, the other point was, and that's the, the, the second last bullet point, the other point was that um, there was an expectation of a so-called coordination profit um, coming out of the cash pool arrangement. That that pops up in quite a few places in uh, in, in the court uh, decision and description of facts. And it looks like that there was not uh, full transparency about the, the transfer pricing policy. So the Norwegian authorities had this notion of um, of an additional profit coming out of the cash pool by by uh, pooling all the um, management of, of excess liquidity. And they basically said, uh, we want the Norwegian company to get a portion of that coordination profit. Um, so that was another argument. Um, finally, the, the court said, um, as one of the arguments in, in upholding the assessment by the tax administration, they said, well, since there's no specific transfer pricing method available for cash pools, then we agree with, with the um, assessment of the tax administration. I think that argument is wrong when, when we circle back to the uh, OCD references, which, which specifically recognize that um, the fact that there's not a, a um, arrangement seen among third parties and uh, does not allow a tax authority to disregard the setup, and instead you should simply apply the, the, the regular transfer pricing methods on the specific transactions. But it's a good, it's a good. Um, it's a good case to, to, to read in order to understand what what um, criticism you might one might be met with by local tax authorities. The next case is from France, and that is not so much about the policy, the transfer pricing policy for a cash pool, but it addresses instead the, the issue of what happens when the cash pool is moved from one country to another. And in this case, the French tax authorities, they said, well, you're moving a a business activity out of France, and to that business activity, uh, there's a profit potential associated, and we, we think that justifies that an exit tax is levied uh, upon the, the the move of the the business activity. Um, Gordon mentioned before that that there are different types of cash pools, and and you might have very simple setups where the the main functionality of the cash pool lies in administration. Um, you might also have more complex setups where the cash pool almost acts as an in-house bank and assumes and, and manages certain risks like forex risk or term risks or, or, or rate risks. Um, and in that situation, the, the cash pool gets a higher compensation, which might start being in the direction of what a, a bank, a third-party bank would earn. Um, if you compare those two situations, and say in the first one where there's a very limited functionality, which should lend itself to also limited compensation. And I think that's the case we're talking about here with, with a fairly low um, margin, cross margin being allocated to the cash pool. In that situation, I think there's a lot, le a lot less of a, a good case for levying an exit tax. Whereas in, in the case where there's more functionality, more risks, and, and a higher compensation, um, that's probably a much better case for, for um, saying an exit tax would be levied on the transfer of such a business activity and the associated uh, profit potential. The decision is still uh, um, pending, or sorry, this, it's been appealed, so um, the final outcome is still pending, um, a, a decision by the Supreme Administrative Court. So uh, let's see what, what the interest result will be later on.
the uh, the last um, slide is about the a selection of criteria that one should consider in in setting a transfer pricing policy for a for a cash pool. Um, I think first of all, start off with a functional analysis or to, to determine the functionality and responsibility of the of the cash pool leader, uh, as we just discussed um, regarding the French case. While well, the more the more functionality, the more responsibilities, the more risks, <clears throat> the higher compensation you should allocate to the cash pool leader. Um, Second, consider if, if the, the credit worthiness of the cash pool participants and the cash pool itself um, is something that should have an impact on, on interest rates. Um, then define the compensation of, of the cash pool leader. Uh, typically, that will be a compensation that is built into the spread, uh, consistent with the, the services chapter of the OCD transfer pricing guidelines, and then the spread might, might vary with, with the functionality. Um, and then I think what is very critical is to start testing in at least a selection of the most important countries um, if the transfer pricing policy um, is likely to, to withstand some scrutiny by, by local tax authorities uh, when they start comparing the interest rate you get on the deposit as a cash pool participant or the interest rate you pay on, a, on an advance. Um, what also is critical is to run a, a financial analysis of this in a, in, a, in a spreadsheet to basically see how, how profits of the pool are shared and how the, um, uh, the, the profit allocation to the pool looks like. Um, it might also, depending on the volatility, as Gordon uh, talked about, be necessary to revisit the arrangements uh, on a regular basis. Uh, we often recommend that at least a quarterly review is being done uh, because the cash, most cash pools are uh, dealing with short-term deposits and short-term advances, and, and there might be a, quite a lot of volatility in, in, in the total balances of, of the pool over time. Um, a local, a, a, sorry, a regular review can also then lead to some price adjustments uh, within the benchmarks on a regular basis, and I think that's also consistent with the OECD guidelines to to uh, uh, address that um, and, and be transparent about that and have that worked into the, uh, the legal framework for the cash pool. I think that's that's enough for this slide. Um, that takes us to the last one, which is basically any questions that that uh, you might have. Um, if you don't have any questions now, uh, by the way, questions can be sent to the chat function. Um, if you don't have any questions now, but something comes to mind, feel free to uh, contact us per, per email. We'll be happy to, uh, to address uh, any, any uh, additional questions coming up. I don't see any, any questions coming in, so I think we will suggest that we say thank you for now and uh, thank you for everyone's participation, and we open to answer questions later on. We'll be sending around the slides and also an article about the cash pools, um, probably coming out tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.